out. And then, you know, the opportunity with Shaq came and he was like, you know something, check this out. Let's just get Shaq on the record. Let's give him a shot or whatever. But before we even did that, we went to the studio and, and dude was spitting his own balls and everything was fine. And I don't want nobody to think that we wrote his balls for him. That's all him. And, you know, he, he was he was serious when he walked in there with his pen, with his paper and everything, and he stood in the booth and he took direction and he got that verse out. So big shout out to Shaq for that. Salute, y'all. Were you, y were you pleased? Way, was you Congrats. pleased? Were you pleased overall with the sophomore album? The second album out? No. No. There were some elements that were missing. And like I said, keep it 100. Um, I started bumping heads with with Mark at the time, so I we so I had to actually do more work than I should have been doing to get that album complete, if you understand. But um, we got it done, and um, but there was more records that we could have put on there. I think the element that was missing from that album was actually us, because you know we we were that group that mixed the reggae with hip hop, and there was none on that album. Then you had no hints on none of that stuff, so. For it to even do what it did, we were kind of shocked, you know what I mean? But they, I think that that album was basically missing us at the time because we would, we just, it wasn't fun at the time when we were doing it, you know what I mean? So it was just about walking in there and doing what we had to do. So after your first- Cat, uh, what's happening? Dallas, what one? What's happening? Don't mind me. I'm just shouting to my peoples right here. Animal, what's up? Izzy, what one? Plastic, crazy, what one, everybody? It's from the soul, Barbados. What's happening? I see you, Cuzzo family, fresh. Yeah, you could ask a question. Divine after, Chris, what's happening? After the sophomore album, what was your relationship like with Jive Records? Uh, well, my relationship with say that question again. What was the relationship like? Why, basically, why didn't we get a third album from the Fushnickens? That it was time to leave that label, and at that time, I wasn't really feeling. Um, I wasn't feeling the situation. I mean, for me, it was more so about growth. And I think that the company wanted to take us in a different direction that we were comfortable with. At the same time, we were out, we were open to work um, with certain producers or whatever, but it came to a point where, um, like I said, man, just we're, us working together like that, that it was, it was a different type of energy. And the only way we could have gotten things done is if we had the, you know, we brought back the right energy. You know what I'm saying? And that energy could not come back for nothing, no matter how hard we tried. And um, I was hurt because I gave up. When Jive asked me to do, when Jive wanted, Jive wanted a, a, a solo album from me. I passed on the solo album so we could do another Fushnik album. Now, I don't know how many people you know that would do that, but I did that because I wanted to make sure that we was all right and we were able to take care of our families. So for me to do that and for us to go into an album, and while we're doing this album and you're acting like an idiot, that didn't make any sense for me. You understand what I'm saying? And um, God rest the dead, my father, he was just like, yo, you should have just took that, you know, took the chance, son, and went on your own, you know, because you don't know if they would have done the same thing for you as as friends, but I figured... You know, I was raised different, and, you know, we're, we're now getting to a point where we were doing a lot for our families at the time. So I figured, nah, let's just, just rock as a group and do what we had to do. But then for it to start like that, and, you know, you're getting, you know, you're pulling your hair out because one member is just not focused as you are, that, you know, that that really made me feel a, a, a way. You feel what I'm saying? So that second album could have been a, a lot better, but um, it is what it is. We got past it. It did what it did. It went gold, and I'm happy. Saying so, yeah. Did uh, a lot of tension start by them catching wind that you had a solo deal? Were they cool with you getting a solo deal, or was that a, a problem? It wasn't a problem because I'm an honest person. I told them when that when they when they called me into the meeting, and I went into the the um, the meeting, and they was like, "Well, we don't want to do another Fushnik album. We want to do a solo album." I sat there, and I was like, "Well, let me think about it." I walked out in the hall. I told my two bros. Uh, uh, you know, one some you know some one of them was receptive to it, another one wasn't. Um, then I went home. I said, "Let me sleep on it." I went home and I thought about it, and I was just like, "You know, we need to be able to take care of our families because we were taking care of a lot of people at the time." So I came back and made the um, the decision not to do uh, a solo album. And my father, and my brother was was 
like my family was kind of upset for me because they knew that, they, that there was a lot more things that I was able to do. And they felt that at that time, I should have done what I needed to do and, and then bring the group back out after or, you know, made sure I did what I did. Kind of like what Brian Nubian did, you know, uh, Grand Poobah went out there and did what he did. Then they came back and did another album. But just make sure that people was just getting different dimensions of music from all of us. But I wasn't, you know, I just figured that we needed to do another group album, you know. I got a question from DITC. Um, he, you were part of that uh, last show on Arsenio Hall show. Can you take us back to what that atmosphere lot was like, that big freestyle session? Yo, I mean, everybody was sitting there from every. We were at. Uh, it was a room filled with all of the 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 the, the, um, the biggest hip hop groups in the '90s were sitting in one room. So you got egos. But then you have, you know, you had groups that was just like, man, I just want to go up there and just rhyme. And shout out to Pete Rock. No one was doing anything until Pete Rock dropped that beat when we were at the uh, the studio. And then everybody started walking up, talking about who was going to go first or who was going to go second or whatever. And and that's how it started, you know. And then for us to all leave that room knowing that we were all cool, because you're in a room with people that, you know, you don't know if you're cool. You got everybody in that room. And at the end of the day, it was one of the the, the, the highest rated Arsenio Hall shows that he's done. And um, I thank God that I was part of that cypher. That's one of the biggest 90 cyphers in history, actually. How did you feel uh, uh, Jive Records putting out a greatest hits album? Yo, them boy, that, yo, let me not cuss, yo. Um, Jive knew at the time that they could have, they, 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 at that particular point in time, I was ready to do the solo album. And then they wanted me to do, they wanted me to do a reggae album at that time. And I was like, Is you, you either want the hip hop or you want the reggae, which one you want? And it was just like, well, you know, just give us a mixture of both. And then they sent me down to Jamaica <clears throat> to work with Steely and Cleavey. And they had me in Jamaica. I was in Jamaica for three weeks before Steely and Cleavey even showed up or called me. I should have just got back on the plane and came home. And the nigga showed up three <laughs> weeks after. The nigga showed up three weeks after on some Wagwan chip. I was like, nah, nigga, you had me here for three weeks, bro. Like, come on. So even working with them, I was already taken back. Like, yo, I even want to work with these dudes at this point in time. So I never worked with them. I came back. And then at that time, I was just upset with the industry. Like, yo, you know, it's finally my time to do what I want to do. But they're not putting in the the, the kind of effort that was needed at the time so i just didn't do it so when they wanted to do the greatest hits i was like go ahead do what y'all want to do so if you listen to the greatest hits there's a song called original rude boy on there that was the first record i was i recorded for the reggae album the reggae hip-hop album and then you we had this song on there called um uh i think it was ghetto something where we worked with uh salam remy so we started working with salam remy at the time but if Jive gave us enough time to finish up, we would have made sure that the, the, the um, third album would have been tough. But, you know, it's all right, though. Is it true that Clive Davis wanted you to sign the J Records at one point in time? Damn, how you know all this? Hey, um, hey, yeah, hey. Um, yes, I was supposed to sign to Clive Davis's J Records label. Uh, how that came about is um, I had a song called Generals, and the song was... This is weird. The song was given to a friend of mine. That song, my friend had to go and paint somebody's um, apartment in the city. So he happened to be painting the apartment of the A&R at, at um, J Records. The, and he was playing the song while he was painting. So the dude was like, yo, who's that? He was like, yo, that's Chip Fool. He was like, you got to be kidding me because it was a reggae song. They got in touch with me. They brought me in. The first thing that they wanted me to do was actually write for Jimmy Cozier. So I wrote a song, I co-wrote a song with Jimmy Cozier called Official Woman at the time, uh, which was supposed to be released on his album. Um, yeah, nobody know that. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to talk about that stuff. Yeah, so they brought me in to do some writing for Jimmy Cozier. Came in, did what I had to do. The, the song was incredible. And then they were waiting for me to, they were waiting to drop that album so people would know that I was um, capable of writing. So that's when I started doing a lot of writing for a lot of other people. That I can't really speak, I can't even really speak about, but that's how that J Records thing came about, and they wanted me, they wanted me to actually sign to the label as a 
a reggae artist. And I was like, well, just understand that it's going to be half of half moving forward. But then that, um, that whole thing didn't come to fruition. Is it also true mm -hmm. that Go ahead. you were going to sign to Aftermath Records with Dr. Dre? Yes, I was going to sign to Aftermath, <laughs> Aftermath Records with Dr. Dre. Um, when we left Jive, uh, we moved to Oakland. Myself and Pac Fu moved to Oakland. While we were in Oakland, I started recording. And I recorded like a, a seven-song demo. And uh, at the time, Dawn from In Vogue, her boyfriend used to come over to the studio. So he was hearing some of the music I was recording. He was like, yo, you know, that's the time when Dawn was signing as a solo artist to Aftermath. So Dawn took the tape in, and, and, and Dre heard it. And Dre was like, who's this? And he was like, yo, that's Chip Fu from the Foosh Niggas. He was like, get the fuck out of here. Brought us, he flew us in. We came there. It was me and Pac Fu. It wasn't the three of us. So we was there. And he was like, yo, I'm about to sign you guys, and I'm going to sign Special Ed. A lot of people didn't know he was going to sign Special Ed and, and, my, and myself to Aftermath. But then he had a problem. They had a money problem at the time, and they had to put out that um, aftermath album that they put out with uh, with, with 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 oh um, been there done that and all that stuff that stuff he had to put that stuff out first to make money. So while that was happening, I didn't want to wait. So we signed to Howard Kaufman's label, um, which was um, these have this, which is a subsidiary company that was part of Dre's lawyers camp at the time, and that's what we signed. But yeah, Dre wanted to sign us and. I still have those contracts at home and everything. You know what I mean? So, man, a lot of people ain't know that. That's cool. Wow. <clears throat> I also heard that uh, he had a section in his book about this. Did you catch wind of that? Yes, I caught wind that he spoke about um, wanting to sign the Fushnikins and wanting to sign um, to sign Special Ed. I'm, um, I think the time will be performed in L.A. You know, half of Death Row came to our performance. And, you know, because a lot of people didn't know that we were from Brooklyn. They thought we were from Long Island. And they were just like, you know, what do guys from Brooklyn know about doing funk records, like Breakdown? You know, but you got to understand, you know, growing up in my household, we were listening to all sorts of stuff. Um, and then Dre was like, yo, Breakdown sounds like a song that I would orchestrate, which was big to hear Dr. Dre say. He said, it sounds like a song that I would orchestrate. It sounds like a song. Versus, and you guys really worked on the chorus. And if you think about it, Right after that, around that time when Breakdown dropped, everything that came from the Aftermath camp, you had my man, God Rest the Dead, was singing on all the choruses, and he was singing in a low pitch. What's his name? Um, um, Nate Dogg. Uh, Nate Dogg. Right. But remember, Nate Dogg used to sing, sing on all the tracks. He never was doing that low bass sound with his voice until after we dropped Breakdown. Ah. Yeah, I'm letting a lot of stuff out the bag, man. Yeah, yeah this is what it Dre. is. Shout out to Dre. <laughs> Shout out to Dre. A lot of people ain't know that we was going to sign in. Shout out to Dre. Have you done any ghostwriting that you can talk about? I've done plenty, and I can't talk about it. <laughs> Fair enough. I've done plenty. Uh, I can't, I, you know, certain, I, I can't let too many people know. There's a lot of stuff I did that I ain't really tell too much people about. And not even my family, uh, you know what I'm saying? The only thing that they knew about was the Insane Clown Posse when they asked me to write for them. And I, I refused it. And um, they started, you know, I refused it because it was talking about uh, lynching black people. Oh. The name of the song was called Let's Go Chicken Hunting. And they called me in and I was shocked that they called me in. And it was like, well, you know how you double time? We want to write a song like this. And I had to look at all the Jive representatives and let them know, how could I write a song for the Insane Clown Posse talking about lynching black people? You know, and I, I, I just, at the time, I needed money, but I had to really think about it first. You know what I'm saying? My pride and everything else comes first before, the, before any type of dollar amount. And the dollar amount, my friend, was pretty good. But I said, yo, I'm going to have a son one day, and if he ever heard that I ever wrote a song about disrespecting black people, I don't know how he would look at me, so I'm glad I didn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? So that's the one song that I turned down, but everything else I did do, which I can't really talk about. But the Insane Clown Posse, no, nah, I didn't do that. Uh, do you still communicate with the other two members, and is there any chance for new music or... No new music. Music? no new music. I only communicate with one of the members. Um, yeah, next question. 
your thoughts on the current state of hip hop? I think that the current state of hip hop is is in a good place um, because you know you can't get mad at these MCs nowadays because they have to find their creative space and they found their creative space and whatever it is that they're doing is basically you know that's them. You get what I'm saying? So even if, I mean there's some that I like and there's some that I don't, but I can't get mad at the fact that they found their um they found their own niche and they're doing what they're doing. So I can respect some of it, not all. Is there anybody in the future that you would like to work with as far as MCs and producers go? Ah, uh, Royce the Five Nine, Eminem, Busta Rhymes, um, uh, Lauren Hill, uh, uh, Maxi Priest, uh, Dag Maxi Priest. I want to work with Bungie Garland too. I said that before. Bungie Garland is a soca artist. We were supposed to work a long time ago. Um, there's a lot of other people, but that's, that's my, that's my list right there. Um, Jay-Z too, if he ever picks up the mic again, I'd like to touch the mic with Jay or whatever. And Nas, and I think that's it. What about producers? Uh, Rock Wilder, we're actually working right now. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I think the producers that I want to work with, I'm actually working with right now. So we can move on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, I heard about your math workshops in high schools. How is that going? Oh, the math workshops in high schools is going pretty good. Oh, shout out to everybody that's on here, family. What's happening? It's going pretty good. Um, I got to thank God for that because I got the inspiration for the the, the, the math workshops from my mother. She had a, um, a daycare center on the block um, called the I.I. Daycare Center when she, where she basically would teach regular kids and kids with special needs at the time, and I never knew that at, while she was doing that, she was actually grooming me to actually open up these workshops to work with uh, regular kids and um, regular kids in high schools, middle schools, junior high schools, kids in ALC schools, and kids with special needs, and in college. So I was able to create a curriculum that was able to basically work in all forms of, of teaching. So I, I thank God for that, and I'm, I'm, I gotta, you know, thank my mom for. Um, foresight and seeing that and, and me just being around that and being able to, to, to soak that up and, and move forward and do that and to continue her legacy, excuse me. Flatbush, we there in the house. What's up, y'all? How was it transitioning from MC to teacher? Well, that was an easy thing because, you know, I was an English major in school. So being able to talk to people, you know, and plus being an, an artist, it's just basically felt like performing and standing in front of the class and making sure that they hear me for one and they get what I'm trying to say. So it was crazy that some kids were coming in with their parents and then the parents would be like, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. And then they're telling their kids all these stories. And, you know, the majority of the time it's, um, since it's, it's the, the curriculum is music based, you know, we start writing music together and they look at me and be like, yeah, what do you know about music? And then, It'd be that one kid in the class that just want to challenge me and I got to spank him. And, and <laughs> it, I mean, and it works out in my favor because now that kid who wants to be the alpha male in the class now is the, the you know what I'm saying? Uh, he, he, he wants to basically do what I tell him after everything. So it all works out in our favor. And the, I, the part of it that I love is the fact that some of those kids, I'm actually able to pay them now to come back with me into schools to teach other classes. So it's, it's a continuation of, uh, you know, you gotta, it, you gotta make sure you continuously pour into these kids, not just in the classroom. So now I have them actually teaching in different classrooms, you know, and, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to put on their resume that they've, they've worked with um, several grades of kids, you know what I mean? So, and, and, and some of their parents basically will continuously call me and thank me because, you know, I was able to, to, to change the mind of some of these kids. Right. That, that, that's fantastic. Um, Cat, what's up? I'm listening. Where where does Chip Foo see himself in the next 10 years? Oh, man, in the next years, old Kung Fu Skippy. Huh? <laughs> the, next, <laughs> the next 10 years, um, math will be a solid curriculum in schools. I will be running my own record company. Uh, by that time, I'll probably be five albums deep with certain things that I'm working on. Um, I'll be doing a lot of real estate and a lot of teaching at that time, but everything will be music based. Um, 
yeah, that's what I see myself in 10 years. I'm happy with my family, my wife, and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be good at that point in time. I still, I'm still going to be hungry.